Hello everyone and welcome to the Job Accommodation Network's monthly webcast series. Today's webcast is called Ergonomics for Teleworkers. I'm Lisa Mathis and I'm joined by the rest of the motor team, which includes Matthew McCord and Tatum Story. Before we start today's program, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. First, if any of you experience technical difficulties during the webcast, please use the pod located at the bottom of your screen to send a chat message or send an email to question at askjan.org. Second, you may submit questions during this presentation using the question and answer chat pod located at the bottom of your screen. To use the pod, just type in your question and then submit to the question queue. You can also send questions at any time during the webcast to our email account at question at askjan.org. Time permitting, questions received via the chat pod will be answered at the end of the presentation. On the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a file share pod. If you have difficulty viewing the slides or would like to download them, click on the button that says download file. And finally, at the end of the webcast, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window. We really appreciate your feedback, so please stay logged on to fill out the evaluation form. And now, let me introduce Tatum's story. Hello. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on with the slides. Um, we would like to start by going over some of the objectives or expectations for this presentation on ergonomic equipment for telework or working from home. Throughout our presentation, we will go over some of the ergonomic basics, including what the term ergonomic truly means and how ergonomics play a role in the health and well-being of employees with and without disabilities. Then we will discuss ergonomic evaluations and what one might expect with that process. Oftentimes, there are professionals who can perform these assessments, but the information is also laid out in a way that a layperson can do the assessments and adjust as needed. Um, then, we will attend it, then we intend to talk about some of the common problems for those issues and discuss remedies, solutions, and products that may assist in solving some of these matters. And then finally, we will get into tips and resources for home setups. Right now, many entities across the nation are enforcing telework, and so JAN, as well as other organizations, have been putting together practical tips for setting up home offices. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so we would like to start by discussing um, Jumping right in, we'll go over the definition of ergonomics. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines ergonomics as an applied science concerned with designing and arranging things to people so that people and things interact most efficiently and safely. According to the Human Factors in Ergonomic Society, Human Factors is concerned with the application of what we know about people, their abilities, characteristics, and limitations to the design of equipment they use, environments in which they function, and jobs they perform. Both of these definitions seem extensive. We at JAN like to refer to ergonomics as the science of fitting jobs to people. Next slide, please. Now, here are some statistics that support the prevalence of workplace injuries and just how big the impact of sitting can have on our bodies. Musculoskeletal disorders, or MSDs, are injuries or disorders of the muscles, nerves, tendons, joints, ligaments, and bones. MSDs account for 33% of workplace injury and illness cases. In fact, just last year a study came out that claims one in two adults are living with an MSD. A 2015 study showed that prolonged sitting increases risk for various serious health conditions, such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, um, even for those who exercise regularly. We included this slide in our presentation really just to showcase that the way we work can and does have an effect on those with and without disabilities. It's not unique or specific to an industry in particular or the jobs we do, but that sitting in itself has been shown to be problematic. Next slide, please. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, has indicated that even when workstations are set up correctly and ergonomic principles are implemented, 
users can still be at risk for developing musculoskeletal disorders. In addition to information about computer workstations, workstation environments, and ergonomic checklists, OSHA offers a list of signs and symptoms to look for that could indicate an employee is at risk for a musculoskeletal disorder associated with computer use. They include numbness or a burning sensation in the hand, reduced grip strength in the hand, swelling or stiffness in the joints, pain in wrists, forearms, elbows, neck, or back, reduced range of motion in shoulders, neck, or back, dry, itchy, or sore eyes, blurred or double vision, aching or tingling, cramps, weakness. Um, if an employee is, is experiencing these signs or symptoms, it does not automatically mean they will develop a musculoskeletal disorder. However, it may be a good indication that the user could benefit from an ergonomic assessment or evaluation and that the workstation may need to be modified. Next slide, please. There are many reasons employers should consider implementing ergonomic practices and principles into their workplace, whether as an ADA reasonable accommodation standpoint, as a general practice for all employees in the workplace, and also as we're seeing now as a response to the current public health crisis, as many of us continue to telework for the foreseeable future. Some benefits of a universal design or ergonomic considerations are to reduce worker compensation claims, to reduce leave time due to injuries and illnesses, to create a safe and inclusive workspace, to satisfy their accommodation obligations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. There are a variety, oh, next slide please. There are a variety of medical conditions ergonomic assessments can benefit. This by no means is an exhaustive list, but there are some of the but these are some of the impairments that we see frequently at JAN that may benefit from an ergonomic evaluation. Back injuries, a variety of cumulative trauma injuries such as baritis, carpal tunnel, elbow, tennis elbow, trigger finger, tendonitis, thoracic outlet syndrome. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2016, musculoskeletal disorders involving the back accounted for almost 40% of all work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Next slide, please. Moving right along, to, right along to universal designs in regard to most likely an office setting or an office setting at home. A universal design is the design of buildings, products, or environments to make them accessible and usable to all people regardless of age, disability, or other factors. There are some things we want to be mindful of when trying to be as accessible as possible to as many users as possible. First, consider providing telework as a general benefit of employment. Don't make it an accommodation if it's doable from home. Many thrive in the home space, and that is something we've seen throughout the past few months. Next, provide ergonomic adjustable chairs and desks. This can allow an employee to move positions and alternate between sitting and standing as needed throughout the workday. Humans aren't meant to sit for eight plus hours a day staring at a computer screen, and so giving people the flexibility may better their health and in turn better their progress productivity, and quality of work. You will see when we get into the tips of teleworking ergonomics, a big theme is going to be to utilize a full-size computer monitor even when working from a laptop. Standalone monitors are going to be more adjustable and can be deemed more appropriate for an array of users, so just consider getting into the practice of furnishing separate monitors for those teleworkers as there are many benefits to this simple change. Also, ensuring that computers are preloaded with assistive technology software. This can, this can range from a speech recognition software option to screen readers and magnification, just an array of programs that are often used by those with disabilities. It is important to make sure that individuals with these programs on their in-office computers have them at home as well so they can work efficiently and effectively. Lastly, looking at the last bullet of having a selection of alternative mice and keyboards. There are many options of alternative mice and keyboards, like miniature keyboards, trackballs, split keyboards, large button keyboards, even foot controls, as, many, as well as many other products to consider. We are all different and have different preferences and needs, and so it is important to be mindful of what people may request. For detailed information on developing and implementing a universal design, check out Jan's publication, Universal Design, and our Jan article titled, Accessible Computer Workstations, a Snapshot. Now Lisa will take over and speak about ergonomic assessments. 
So getting into best practices when assessing an ideal workstation, a focal point in ergonomic assessments is the position of the computer monitor in relation to the user. To reduce eye strain and fatigue, the monitor should be about 18 to 28 inches away from the user. The top of the monitor should be at or slightly below eye level, and the angle should be between zero and seven degrees. Proper placement of the monitor limits the need for the user to tilt his or her head back to see the screen and limits the need for the user to lean forward to see what's on the screen. If the monitor is correctly positioned and the user has difficulty seeing images on the screen, additional accommodations such as screen magnification may need to be considered. We also want to be mindful of task lighting and those overhead lights that we may be using in our homes. To encourage proper body posture, reduce the need to turn the head from side to side and reduce or limit strain on the head, neck, and shoulders. Input documents should be properly positioned and frequently used items should be within easy reach. The head and neck should be aligned when using the phone and when looking at the monitor with the user's body properly aligned in front of the computer. Lastly, I want to mention that breaks are so important. They can benefit muscles in the upper extremities, but also your eyes need breaks every so often. Are rest breaks built into the workday? To reduce stress on eye muscles, an individual should look away from the workstation and refocus on an object at least 25 feet away and blink often. Rest breaks should also include simple, brief exercises such as shoulder shrugs, neck rolls, ankle rotations, leg extensions, overhead stretches, handshake, and finger spreads. Continuing with the workstation setup, when the arms, elbows, wrists, or hands are not properly supported, this can result in joint or shoulder pain, numbness or tingling in the extremities, and may result in the employee making adjustments that lead to improper posture. In performing an ergonomic assessment, one would want to consider if the elbow or if the employee's shoulders are relaxed, if the elbows are appropriately angled, meaning they're not bent upward or stretched forward, and if wrists are appropriately angled while keyboarding, mousing, or using equipment and tools, and whether or not the mouse or tool fits the user's hand. Wrists shouldn't be resting while typing. Wrists should be in a neutral position, not flexed up or down, so many times this means our keyboard shouldn't be propped up on the keyboard legs that comes with it. Sharp or ed hard edges can irritate nerves and cause discomfort or pain. So it's good to check any areas where elbows or arms are not being properly supported. And we may need to cushion the edges of our workstations. Arms or hands may become fatigued from overuse, so it can be important to consider how long an employee is performing a repetitive task and when micro breaks should be taken. A very common ergonomic concern is whether or not the employee's back, legs, and feet are properly supported. Being that our chair is where we spend a great deal of time, assessments place a lot of focus on evaluating an employee's posture and position when seated. An employee's chair should be supporting the back to provide lumbar support and maintain the natural curvature of the spine. Feet should rest firmly on the floor and hips and knees should be resting comfortably as well. Seat pans should be comfortable in the correct size so that movement isn't restricted, but also not creating pressure from the chair on the back of your knees. There should also be room between top of legs and the underside of the desk so the employee isn't confined. The employee or user should be able to move the chair around freely and shouldn't have to push off the desk or floor to move around the area. Proper positioning of materials, equipment, tools, and the like may reduce or eliminate the need for an employee to move in an awkward way or repeatedly perform the same motion that causes strain on the head, neck, shoulders, or back. In some cases, tools can be provided to help perform a task, and Matt will provide some examples of this later on. Ergonomic assessments or job analysis can help to identify repetitive tasks and tasks that require exertion, which can be then evaluated or modified to ensure that employees perform these tasks in a way that reduces their risk of fatigue or injury.
Assessment should also consider individual needs such as personal use items or assistive technology that employees may be using. Right now with the unique situation of many of us working from home, we need to be that much more mindful of the AT people need to be successful. Assistive technology and other equipment needed as an accommodation to effectively work at home, such as the screen magnification, screen reading software, speech recognition, larger monitor, video phone, sit to stand desk, ergonomic chair, things such as those items need to be considered. And we want to assess those technologies that are unique to an individual and ensure they too are fitted to the person. Environmental concerns, including noise levels, air quality, and temperature variations can also be addressed in these ergonomic assessments. Luckily, when we're assessing these variables for those of us who are teleworking, we often are in control of our own environments in our homes. But as many of you have noticed, it can still get loud between outside noises or those pets and kids are creating those louder noisy environments, which could be distracting. If employees rotating through different job tasks throughout the throughout the day, it may be necessary to evaluate each work setup or analyze each job task individually. Now to take a visual look at assessing a good computer workstation, I wanted to share a diagram of the workstation in the proper ergonomic setup. As the diagram depicts, an ergonomic workstation is one where the monitor is just at eye level or slightly below. The monitor is about an arm's length away. There's minimal bend at the wrists. The back is straight, elbows are close to the body, a backrest is supporting the lower back, and the chair is adjustable and the user's feet are flat on the ground or resting on a foot dress, footrest with room between the front and the front of the seat pan and the back of the knees. This is just one of the many diagrams available that offer an easy guide on how employees can have a ergonomically correct workstation even while working with what we have here in our home offices. These type of diagrams can be a helpful tool for employees and can serve as a nice reminder for proper posture when working on a computer. Okay, so jumping back in, let's go over some of the practices that are easily easy to fall into, but that should be avoided as they can cause some issues. First, we have working in bed, or as we like to call it, master bedroom with a view and neck strain. Although it is tempting to simply grab your laptop and stay in bed while you work, this can cause that awkward bending of the neck and issues with the eye to monitor distance. Typing can also be very awkward for the wrist and forearms, as well as it just being bad practice. It is always it is also always practical to get yourself in the work zone in a work specific setting. Specifically setting your work area from your rest area is always best practice for many reasons. Moving into the living room, it is also good to avoid the couch as your workstation for the same principles and reasons. I know how easy it is to convince yourself that working on the couch to send one quick email is okay, but as we all know and can, can contest, that one email usually turns into multiple emails and before you know it, an hour and a half has passed. The bent over elbows underneath our body weight isn't good for those tendons in our arms, nor is the twisted spine. Always remind yourself that it's not worth the pain it'll put your body through. This is something we've all probably seen or experienced, especially over the past few months. Multitasking or working with a toddler on your lap while trying to type one-handed. The awkwardness is not ideal, not to mention the distraction this can cause that take away from the efforts that should be going into providing meaning meaningful work. I know with kids it can be hard and there are, isn't much you can do, but try your best to be mindful and adjust the best you can. Another big no-no is sitting on the floor, typing with one hand and holding papers with the other. This can go hand in hand with the previous slide on working with children. You know, getting on the floor so that you, your kids think you're playing with them all while trying to multitask and get work done. We see in this photo how this can't be ergonomically correct. The individual's knees are to their chest and they're hunched over their coffee table.
Jan offers information on ergonomics in the workplace, including publications and resource guides. On this slide, we have a screenshot of the Jan, Accom Jan Accommodation and Compliance series on ergonomics in the workplace, a resource guide which can be used to supplement the information presented in this webcast. Linked within the ergonomic publication, we also have additional JAN resources, including assessment providers, which list both virtual and on-site options. We've seen at JAN that many are interested in the virtual assessments right now. Uh, you can also find ergonomic software training and assessment tools on how to conduct an ergonomic evaluation within this resource. Ergonomic equipment is another section we include in this resource, which includes an array of equipment from workstations and chairs to ergonomic staplers and wrist rests. Although Jan does not recommend or endorse any one specific product over the next, we offer information on equipment and products we know exist for your viewing and consideration. For detailed questions related to a product or service, you may find it useful to contact the manufacturer or vendor, or to check in with a healthcare provider to see if they have any recommendations based on an individual's needs. Jan's webpage also offers a variety of information related to various topics, impairments, limitations, needs, and strategies. This is a screenshot of the homepage with the A to Z link circled at the top. Towards the bottom of the page, you will see a drop-down menu where you can select disability, limitation, or work-related function, depending on what information you know or are trying to accommodate. We are we encourage exploring our site as it offers a lot of practical information related to accommodating individuals with all sorts of impairments. Now Matt will take over and discuss some common ergonomic problems and remedies. Thanks Tatum. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the more common problems we face when we're at home and some possible remedies for them. We'll start with probably the most common problem, sitting. This isn't really an issue that's unique to people with disabilities. We all can have trouble with prolonged sitting from time to time. But employees with disabilities, such as back conditions, may have a harder time with it than those without such conditions. Regardless, making sure that our backs and arms are supported, our feet are flat on the floor, and our posture is properly maintained by our workstation setup can help to alleviate pain and discomfort caused by sitting. There is a wide variety of products that may be helpful for employees with medical conditions that make sitting difficult. Some some of the more common options are lumbar support cushions, which may, uh, which you may be using right now in the form of one of the decorative throw pillows from your couch. Appropriate ergonomic chairs. This may be as simple as getting your chair from your office and taking it home, but if not, then even something simple like sturdy dining room sturdy dining room chair can work. But you may need to add in some things to make better, like adding cushions or folded blankets to raise you up to proper height levels to the table. Um, adjustable height workstations. In this case, I was using some old video game strategy guides to prop up my monitor to get it tall enough to where I was eye level with the screen a while ago. And of course, footrests, which can almost, oh, can almost be anything you can find lying around the house. Boxes, reams of paper, wood slabs from your garage that you might have tucked away, all can be considered as a potential footrest. On to slide 24, we wanted to provide some links to resources where you could find some information on this issue. First, our Consultants Corner article titled Best Practices for Addressing Requests for Ergonomic Chairs. And second is our Solution Showcase videos on adjustable workstations and ergonomic chairs. Links to both of these are found on this slide. For our next common problem, using a notebook, computer, or laptop, first and foremost, connecting and using a full-size monitor can be incredibly helpful. As we've already discussed, laptop screens can only be adjusted so much by their design. But with a normal monitor, you can adjust the height to be eye level. This makes it so you no longer need to bend your neck to look at the screen. And with the monitor's larger size, there is often less eye strain, too. 
Along some of the same lines, the use of an external keyboard and mouse can also be very helpful. Wrist strain from awkward typing angles are just as are just as much of a problem at home as it is in the office. And just like with the screen, laptop keyboards can't be adjusted all that much. Working on a laptop alone is not ideal for a variety of reasons. Also, remember to properly support your forearms and palms. The arms of your chair can go a long way if you have them, but something like a rolled up kitchen towel can provide some much needed cushioning. And if you're having to work some days in the office and some days at home, you'll find yourself having to transport that laptop back and forth. Uh, consider using some wheeled luggage to eliminate needing to carry that extra weight back and forth. As for some other products that may help with the use of a laptop computer, um, docking stations can be very useful as they enable laptop users to convert it into something more akin to a desktop computer. The docking station allows you to plug in external equipment with USB ports and serve as a hub for a full-size monitor, keyboard, and mouse. Some also have an Ethernet cable port so you don't have to rely on Wi-Fi as well. With this, your laptop itself will basically serve as a desktop computer tower. There are also standalone forearm supports that you can order from several places like Amazon. But if you would rather not buy out-of-the-box solutions, you can also get creative. As you can see at the bottom right image on the slide, a do-it-yourself setup with a woman sitting at a small desk with a laptop strapped to an angled cardboard box, anything that gets us closer to that ergonomically correct setup is a step in the right direction. Prolonged keyboarding and mousing can be difficult, but for individuals with cumulative trauma disorders such as carpal tunnel syndrome, it can be even worse. Most employees who work in office settings spend a large portion of their day typing on a, new, on a computer nowadays. Implementing ergonomic principles and making minor workstation adjustments can be a good first step to consider when an employee reports difficulty with typing and mousing. Altering and adjusting the placement of the keyboard or mouse is one remedy. Keyboards and mice come in all shapes and sizes, and in some cases the issue may just be that the keyboard or mouse you're using might be just a little bit too big or small. Another simple remedy could be to adjust the armrest on the chair. Remember, the elbow should be close to the body and the armrest is there to support the arms in the proper position. As for some product-based solutions for issues with keyboarding or mousing, the logical first place to start would be looking at alternative keyboards in mice. Beyond that, though, an articulating keyboard may be helpful to adjust the angle of the keyboard or its height. Wrist rests can also be helpful as they will help to support the wrist and palms. A do-it-yourself option may be a rolled up tea cloth or a hand towel to elevate those palms into a more neutral position. Most employees in office settings need to use a phone as part of their job, though as much of it is used will vary from situation to situation. It can be tempting to get into the habit of resting the phone on your shoulder or tilting, tilting your head while talking and typing, but doing so can cause unnecessary strain. Maintaining ergonomic posture while speaking on the phone can reduce discomfort and alleviate pain associated with various conditions. This can be an, as easy as relaxing the shoulders and keeping the head upright. It also helps to move the phone to an area on the desk that's easy to reach, so that way you're not having to stretch repeatedly when you need to make a call. Also, taking micro breaks and standing while talking on the phone can be very helpful. Products like a hands-free headset or a gooseneck phone holder could be used, and that so that there isn't as much of a need to reach for a phone or support the receiver while talking. Putting calls on speakerphone, too, can be appropriate uh, if the situation allows, and it might, allow, uh, might be another solution to reduce pain or discomfort experienced while holding the phone receiver. Thank you, Matt. Now looking at another issue we may face, having to read documents. So when considering document holders, there are a couple different considerations. You could use an inline document holder that sits between the keyboard or the keyboard tray and the screen. 
and it is aligned with your body midline. So all you have to do is lower your eyes to look down to see the documents, raise your eyes to see the screen. Otherwise, you can use a screen mounted document holder and position this to the same side of your screen as your dominant eye. Use a freestanding document holder and position this next to the side of the screen and, and slightly angle it so it follows a curve from the side of the screen. And you don't have to go buy a document holder off the shelf. Many of us have cookbook holders on display in the kitchen, so steal that for the time being. Let's not forget that we don't have to be tied to the chair to do some of the reading. Let us get up and stretch and move it to the couch while we review some of these documents. Little things like that can make a big difference. Eye strain can result from looking at a computer monitor for prolonged periods of time. For some individuals, eye strain can also contribute to the onset of migraine headaches. When employees report that looking at the computer is difficult, a simple remedy or fix could be to reposition the monitor if it's too close or too far from the user. Clean the monitor of dust and dirt or preventing the user from clearly seeing information or reduce glare by adjusting lighting. Products such as a monitor riser or arm, a DIY option here is gonna be a stack of books or a box to get that monitor up higher. Adjust your lighting. Take a look at where the light source is coming from, whether it be the windows, your main ceiling light, or lamps, and adjust the lights and window shades as needed, and continue to adjust as the natural sunshine rotates throughout the day. And an anti-glare filter might also be necessary to provide so that the user doesn't have to strain to see the computer screen when light becomes too harsh and creates that bounce back or glare. Fatigue can be a result of performing the same task repeatedly over the course of a shift or by not taking micro breaks to adjust seating position, to alternate between sitting and standing, or to stretch. Preventing fatigue by remembering to take time throughout the day for these easy remedies can help to prevent computer-related injuries or an exacerbation of an existing condition. Equipment including adjustable height workstations. This might look like working on a stack of something at the kitchen counter to stand at, and then rotating between that setup and the sit down workstation you've created at the dining room table. You can also purchase desktop adjustable workstations. These are just a smaller adjustable unit that has the unit that has the mechanisms to move up and down, but it sets on an existing desk or table. The treadmill or bike workstations could be used to combat fatigue. Amazon and Walmart have pedal exercisers you could shift to your house to keep the blood flowing while seated. Employees may also find it useful to set alarms or reoccurring daily reminders to stretch periodically. Okay, so switching gears to look at some of the telework considerations, more of administrative modifications rather than product-based solutions. Of course, job restructuring removing those secondary duties as an accommodation or changing the way we're performing those essential primary fundamental duties. This may look like a modified schedule, so the employee is working on the hardest tasks when they have the most mental energy or ability to perform. Let's consider some flexibility here. We know that kids are now home with us while we're trying to work, so perhaps extending hours into the evening so work can be done once the kids are pretty much out of our hair. We mentioned the distractions kids and other things can cause, so we might want to consider noise canceling headsets or look at apps for concentration issues. Turning the usual phone call into an instant message or an email so there's less background noise to fight with. And being mindful with your own schedule and really mapping out your day with time chunks and what you want to accomplish during those times. And then, of course, taking a break. We've emphasized this, I know, but I think we just easily forget about breaks when we're trying to be super productive, but ultimately breaks can boost productivity. In similar premise as job restructuring, workplace flexibility. I mentioned allowing people to work when they're most energized or around their other duties. 
it is just the norm now that many of us are trying to maintain a full-time job while having to watch our kids as well because schools are often now virtual based. So perhaps alternating an employee's schedule, letting them adjust as needed to not only get the job done, but allowing them to help the kids with their own school demands as well. Continuing with flexibility, allowing people to move around to take those stretch breaks, use the restroom, perhaps perhaps check in with our colleagues. And then of course, permitting use of time for the check-ins with our service providers. That may look like a therapist or counselor for someone, or it may be someone's immunologist looking, immunologist for a chronic health condition. So with the flexibility, you may need to consider allowing any missed time to be made up or allow someone to use accrued leave or unpaid leave when job duties cannot be performed. Lastly, I want to highlight a new e-news article titled Make Telework Work. It has some practical guidance on home solutions and fixes for the work at home issues or challenges that we all can come across. Okay, let's switch back to the topic of equipment while teleworking. Tatum highlighted the Jan Ergonomics publication earlier with the screenshot on slide 20. So let's not forget that we have these ergonomic considerations in this publication and really go through it and self-assess what you're working with or how you're working. Lots of companies and organizations are pushing out tips and resources to help us better use what we have with our space and equipment. Some of these links are from the Mayo Clinic, Yale, System Concepts. So if you download the slide deck, you will be able to access the hyperlinks to all these great resources. Now focusing on equipment and accommodation issues while teleworking. The issue of what an employer must provide to individuals who telework during ordinary times is one that's complex and it's not addressed by the ADA or EEOC guidance. So during this COVID-19 pandemic, individuals are either requesting to work at home as an accommodation or they're being mandated to work at home along with the rest of the workforce. In either situation, employees typically need the appropriate equipment to do their work, like a laptop or cell phone. So does this mean that an employer might need to provide workstation equipment workstation equipment like an ergo chair or a sit to stand desk. According to the EEOC guidance, the pandemic preparedness guidance, it says during a pandemic, if an individual with a disability needs the same accommodation at a telework site that was provided at the workplace, the employer should do that accommodation absent undue hardship. The example is included about an accountant with low vision who uses screen reading software on their office computer as an accommodation and who has now provided a notebook computer that has a screen reader installed to work at home during the pandemic. But what about those who are now working from home who didn't have accommodations in the office, but now we're having some troubles? Working at home without this equipment can trigger a request for reasonable accommodation when a disability related need for this equipment becomes apparent. So when a request is received from an employee who is not previously accommodated in the workplace, but who is now working at home during the pandemic, an ADA covered employer should initiate in the interactive process and gather disability related information to establish whether they have the right to receive that accommodation under the ADA. A request for accommodation in this situation is handled the same as it is when an individual requests a change in the workplace for a disability related reason. So all that to say, engage in the interactive process regardless what people had and see what you can provide to enable them to be their best version of an employee. So I just went over, we as employers may have to provide equipment as an accommodation for those who are teleworking for whatever reason, but do we as employers have to physically come in and set it up? Or would we be okay shipping a product to you and letting you have at it? At Jan, we're getting lots of accommodation questions on equipment when it comes to this basically forced telework due to state orders. So is the employer responsible to deliver and set up those home workstations? It's not addressed by the EEOC, but we at JAN would say it's better business practice um, to 
have an employer representative to set up the equipment to make sure that the employee is set up for success. I think that's what's going to be ideal. I provided the link to the federal resource telework.gov. This is the main hub of teleworking information specific to federal workers, but they also have these two tools that I thought are useful, the self assessment and the safety checklist. Employees are encouraged to consider the following factors and making honest determination about their telework capabilities. On the self assessment, you can record any concerns you may have and how you will address them in order to telework. This assessment will walk you through general considerations, self management, technology, communication, and appropriate space. Then the safety checklist. This is designed to assess the overall safety of an alternative work site. So let's look at some additional resources. We wanted to include some helpful resources for doing some in-house ergonomic assessments. This e-tool from OSHA illustrates simple, inexpensive principles that will help you create a safe and comfortable computer workstation. There's no single correct posture or arrangement of components that will fit everyone. However, there are basic design goals, some of which was shown on slide 12 to consider when setting up a computer workstation or performing computer related tasks. The Department of Defense and the Computer Electronic Accommodation Program offers this guide which provides illustrations of proper workstation ergonomics. They also provide a checklist for implementation of these strategies, as well as tips for prevention of repetitive stress injuries. As we've gone over, ensuring proper ergonomics is the work in the workplace is a smart business decision because it increases employee productivity and satisfaction while also reducing possible injuries or re-injuries. In addition to the previous resources, we also have some ergonomic tips to share. Colorado State University pushed out some ideal tips. We've gone over many of these things, but you want to use a good chair if possible. If you don't have a good chair, figure out what features you're missing and try filling in those gaps by, say, adding some pillows for back or leg support. You want to raise your chair. Most kitchen tables and desks are too high, so use a seat cushion or a pillow and folded blankets if needed. Support your feet, whether that be on a phone book, a step stool, if they don't firmly touch the ground while seating, sitting. And raise that monitor using books, old shoe boxes, etc. Any bulk item you bought that you don't use too much. And then lastly, use external equipment. It's essential that the monitor is separated from the keyboard and mouse. The top of the monitor should be at or slightly below eye level and shoulders relaxed with elbows around 90 degrees. Human Tech also had some helpful tips to improve home office ergonomics. One feature that's very helpful is the templates they have hyperlinked for do-it-yourself laptop stands. And they have even more resources, which we've linked on this slide. The National Institute of Health offers a tool with accompanied pictures and explanations of various exercises for each category listed on the slide. Each category has between two and eight different movements or stretches to do, so it's very comprehensive. I was happy to see that I already did some of these to help reduce my own strains. So with all this talk of equipment adjustments and being mindful of positioning and postures, what would be the number one takeaway from all this? Really getting up and moving is probably what we need the most. Our bodies are simply not designed to stay in static positions for long periods of time, and that includes sitting at a computer. This doesn't mean that you have to stop working now. Take that phone call while standing, walking around your office space. Do neck stretches while you are typing up that report. Give yourself a wrist massage while you're on that Zoom call. It can also be helpful to set reminders on your computer or phone to remind you to stand up and move. Old habits are break, hard to break after all. And practice the 20-20-20 rule. 
For every 20 minutes of computer use, take 20 seconds and look at something 20 feet away. We also wanted to plug the Jan Coronavirus Disease 2019 page. It has lots of useful resources on it from handling accommodation requests to reduce exposure to COVID, which medical conditions may be at higher risk of COVID and more. We also have a blog article in it on mental health considerations in light of everything COVID as well. This is a pandemic and such situations cause more problems than just the disease itself after all. Here are a few links to help resources regarding COVID-19 that are not housed, that are now housed on the JAN site as well. EEOC has pushed out some really helpful EEOC guidances. And before we begin our Q&A segment of the presentation, we wanted to just remind you that we're still available to answer your questions. We are teleworking due to the pandemic though, so chat and email is the best way to reach us. However, if you prefer to call, we can get back to you if you leave us a voice message that way as well. And now let's take a look at some of the questions we have from our audience. As a reminder, to use the question pod, just put your cursor on the line next to the word question, type your question, and then click on the arrow to submit to the question queue. Okay, someone asked, my mouse hand is considerably colder, uncomfortably so, than my non-mouse hand. Do you have any information on this experience? Matt, do you want to, is your mic working enough to answer that? Did you, I know we have a lot of great products on the solution page. Uh, well, this is what I sound like, so, um, but one option that might be called would be our vendor listing for heated ergonomic uh, keyboard products. Specifically, we have some wrist, wrist supports on there that might be helpful um, to use. It can help to just give some generalized heat to the hand area in general, both for the keyboard and for the mouse. So that would be what I would suggest for that. Yes, if you go to the Ask Jan website, um, under temperature sensitivity, we have a bunch of computer products hyperlinked and that wrist uh, heated wrist pad is useful and there's some USB heated products as well there. So that can be good for any kind of numbness and temperature sensitivities in that non dominant hand. Um, looking at more questions during the eight hour workday, how often should we take breaks to stand and for how long? I really liked that slide on the 20-20-20 rule, every 20 minutes, um, take a break and look at something that's 20 feet away for 20 seconds. I thought that was good. I think you could um, couple that with, you know, the standing dual lap around the house um, and get back at it. So I think the 20-20-20 is just easy to remember. Um, Do you have any specific suggestions for ergonomic chairs or back cushions to help modify a desk chair? Tatum, do you have any input on ergonomic chairs or cushions? Yeah, so it all is really dependent on the individual and the setup that they have. Um, we can't really recommend or endorse anything, but we do have a page on adjust adjustable office chairs on our website that kind of lists some of the products that um, we typically send out and hear good things from. It can be found on our okay. website through by looking at adjustable, um, adjustable workstations for our office settings, adjust ergonomic and adjustable office chairs as well. Okay, and then I had another attendee chime in on the cold hand from mouse use. And they said the reason the mouse hand is colder is probably because the mouse is not aligned right too high and it pinches the shoulder muscle. I have the same issue. The solution is to lower the mouse. 
Okay, that's a very good tip. Um, good insight for sure. When granting an employee to work from home, do you have to implement it ASAP or are employers allowed some window time to make arrangements to implement that? I mean, under ADA, there's not a required uh, time frame to respond to accommodation requests. The EEOC just says, act as quickly as possible. Unnecessary delays could be problematic. And if that means looking at temporary accommodations or trial accommodations until you make that final decision, I think that would be better business practice than just forcing people out on leave and not implementing anything in the meantime. Um, but we really you know, need to be mindful and kind of get accommodations done as quickly as possible. There shouldn't be those unnecessary delays. Um, how does an employer conduct an ergonomic assessment for an employee working from home during COVID-19? You can't maintain social distancing. Well, on a slide that Tatum had, she did um, discuss virtual ergonomic assessment providers. So if you go to our website at the ergonomic page, we do have a hyperlink of vendor list that includes virtual ergonomic assessments. So that would be a professional doing that um, and the costs can vary. So that's one thing to look at, into if the employee is not comfortable doing a self-assessment. Is it appropriate for employers to respond to an employee needing a sit stand at home to tell them they can't work from home and must return to the office? The office is deemed safe, but all other staff are allowed to work from home. I'm gonna jump in here and answer this. Um, ultimately, employers are permitted to choose among effective options when it comes to choosing among effective options for accommodations. But I think you do want to be mindful of dignity issues. Whereas if everyone in the office is allowed to telework, you don't want to have the person with a disability kind of jumping through unnecessary hoops and more barriers for that person. And especially in the case of the, if they could just transfer their office equipment to their home office. So you're not purchasing a second set of equipment, you're just letting them take it home. I think that is a win-win for both parties um, and should be considered. Yeah, and as Tatum said, we don't endorse or recommend one product or vendor over another. So in regards to price ranges, you would have to reach out to the uh, vendor specifically. Can you give me more information on the virtual worksite evaluations? Uh, we had one done at the JAN office a couple years ago and we sent in pictures and they did a virtual Zoom call and really kind of assessed how my colleague was working and really gave like practical tips and equipment ideas with things we already had even. Um, and like I said, those virtual worksite evaluations, those are linked on the ergonomics page. So if you go to askjan.org, go by topic and scroll down to ergonomics, everything will be hyperlinked there. But don't hesitate to send an email to jan at askjan.org um, if you have a specific questions we're not getting to. Um, okay, and someone, another attendee chimed in about the cold hand due to the mouse. Um, it's most likely related to static muscle tension in the hand, which is reducing circulation. 
start using the mouse left-handed, take more frequent stretch breaks for the hand, and increase your physical activity out of work. Again, great information. Did you say we need to provide ergonomic chairs at home due to the pandemic? Um, I would say you need to consider it. EESC has made a pretty strong stance. If you provided an ergonomic chair pre-COVID, then that person you know, should get that accommodation absent hardship. And even in the cases that someone didn't have an ergonomic chair pre-COVID, if they need it now and they have a ADA covered disability, Again, you're going to want to consider furnishing that ergonomic chair absent hardship. Okay, one more comment about the um, cold hand with the mouse. Usually it has to do with posture and potential compression on the edge of the workstation, not a product solution. Also good information. Tatum, do you have any comments on like lighting? Um, I know we kind of talked about what is proper lighting, but there really isn't a one size fits all. Do you have any input on that? Yeah, just like you said, it's really dependent on the situation and the individual, um, making sure that the distance is, um, you know, ergonomically sound is always a good idea. The Jan page has a couple um, product pages related to lighting that you can check out on our solutions page. Um, there's alternative lighting where you'll see some product ideas, um, non-fluorescent lighting to combat like a fluorescent setting, um, full spectrum or natural lighting products, LED lighting, modified lighting, um, reading and highlighting products. It's all really just dependent on the setting that an individual's in and what they need. Yeah, and I think too little lighting is just as problematic as too much lighting and those glares. So those uh, glare filters are also helpful. So oh, really yes, it's definitely. gonna be an individualized assessment. And I think that's about all the time we have today. So I wanna thank you for attending and a special thanks to all our speakers. I also wanna thank Alternative Communication Services for providing the net captioning. If you need additional information about anything we talked about today, please let us know. And if you want to discuss an accommodation, please feel free to contact us at JAN. We hope the program was useful. As mentioned earlier, an evaluation form will automatically pop up on your screen in another window as soon as we're finished. We appreciate your feedback, so we hope you'll take a minute to complete the form. Again, thank you for attending.